founder and executive director of the Care Plan Agency. She's got 15 years of expertise in senior care. And today she's going to explore tools and resources to help us make informed decisions about care planning and care management. So Jacqueline, welcome, and we wait to hear from you. Thank you so much. And hello, everybody. It is wonderful to be with you. Uh, if there's any sound issues or tech issues, please let me know. In this new digital world, sometimes the, sometimes the tech doesn't always work. So if there's any issues, please let me know. I know that you're comfortable using the chat from what Michelle shared, but I, if we were in person, we would be having a very dynamic conversation. So there are going to be points I ask for you to share a bit about your experience, any questions you might have, and to learn from each other, not just to have me up here talking at you. Um, so, so don't hesitate to put your thoughts in the chat or to come off and, and share a bit of your story with the group. My name is Jackie Boyd. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and they, them. And five years ago, I founded the Care Plan. I'm a huge supporter and proponent of care management and of planning ahead for care. Uh, I've worked in nursing homes since I was 18 years old as a CNA, and that was really where I learned what the good, the bad, and the ugly looks like of senior care, and it made me deeply passionate about how we can think about aging differently, how we can and should look forward to it, and put some, put some plans in place so that we're not just talking about, okay, what happens to my assets and oh, do I have enough money to retire and do I have my will? But really all those points in between of where am I going to live? Who's going to support me? How does my family and friends and loved ones know the decisions I want to make? So once we open up that space to say, what do I want the fourth quarter to look like? We get different answers. And I think it's so helpful to plan ahead for that to be sure that you have the experience you want to have. Aging on accident doesn't tend to work out particularly well. People don't feel like they're in control of their aging experience. They don't always know what resources are available. And sometimes people feel like they're at the mercy of the healthcare system rather than in the driver's seat. So that's just a little bit about why I'm passionate about this. Um, and I'm gonna go back and forth between, the, between this view and my presentation. But I'm curious to get started. I'm going to put a slide that, that gets at this point. But if you think about what your goals are for the last 10 years of life, what you want those 10 years to look like, to feel like, who you want around you, how you want to, what quality means to you in those 10 years, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Michelle, can you give me the host? capability, please. Thank you. I'm sorry, Jacqueline. Absolutely. Just a moment. So think about the 10 years of life for that fourth quarter. What does health look like? What does um, nutrition look like? What does social look like? What does good medical care look like? What's enough money? What is being comfortable to you? So I'm going to share my screen. Thank you so much, Shell. Love to hear from one or two people about, you know, when you think about the fourth quarter and being in retirement, having a bit more time and maybe having some different challenges, what's important to you? What are your goals? Sylvia, Ina Grace, Dottie, anybody want to chime in? Well, this is Anna Grace. I think for my goals, um, my husband is 15 years older, so we tend to think of caring for him rather than for me. But um, I think I want to be able to be comfortable, um, to be able to have friends around, and um, not to have to worry too much about things. And Anna Grace, do you mind talking a little bit about how you, how, so your strategies for how to achieve that? You know, I wonder if being part of the village is part of that picture. 
to have those well, connections and quality of life. Part of the village is, but then personally, we have taken steps. We, 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 for long-term care insurance, the money, we've also taken steps um, with TIA CREF that has our retirement funds to make that we have, make sure we have sufficient funds. I think my husband worries that I will be alone, but that's where the village and our church probably come into play. Absolutely. Okay. So you, the being comfortable, having friends around, having that social connection is really important. Yes. Thank you so much, Anna Grace. Thank you. Anybody else want to chime in? What else is important to you? This is Susan Alito. And what's important to me is um, decluttering, getting ready. I don't want to leave my messes for my daughter to clean up after me. Um, so, uh, I'm trying to work. Susan, it's great to hear your voice. You came and spoke at a couple of events that I hosted a few years ago. Really great to hear your voice again. Um, and so one of your goals, it sounds like is decluttering or what might be called downsizing to make sure that all the stuff we accrue in the span of a lifetime isn't left to our children to sort through and try to try to um, find a home for. Do you have a, do you have a plan, Susan, for how you want to do that? <laughs> well, yes and no. <laughs> uh, certainly, the pandemic sort of helps. I'm spending more time at home working at it. Uh, the village has also formed a declutterer support group where we meet periodically to encourage and help each other with those projects. Awesome. Awesome. So you have some ideas, you're, you're participating and it's an intention. Um, I think you're exactly what you're saying is part of the reason why sometimes people appreciate having a care manager in their lives. And that's because it's just sometimes easier to get it done. If you have another person support, right? If you can say, okay, this is your goal. How are we going to get there? Here's the resources that we can provide you. Here's a timeline that you can decide on and be comfortable with. And here's some accountability support for making sure it gets done or some companionship to come over and do some packing with you and make sure that you're not alone in that process. Because it can be hard, right? It can be hard whether we're talking about decluttering or picking up the phone to make our uh, to make our financial arrangements or our burial arrangements or to send our POA paperwork to the doctor. There's a lot of different tasks that you all have going on. And sometimes having somebody else to support you is a reason why people appreciate care management. Anybody else want to chime in about what's important to you in the last 10 years? This is Kathy Williams. Um, one of the things that I think most of us were motivated uh, to join uh, the village is staying in our neighborhoods. And I know that was very important to my mother as she aged. She was in a different position than a lot of us in that she did not work. So she was the caregiver for her parents and her in-laws as were many women in the neighborhood. But then once she was older, she had to relocate because none of us lived in the community any longer. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's rather difficult when you, especially for women who tend to live longer, uh, you care for everyone and then there's no one really to care for you. So I think that's a problem. Yes, yes, that certainly is a challenge. And I think that's, you know, that's again, a, part of the reason why I'm such an advocate for this, because if we are taking care of everybody else and not investing in our own needs, then you can feel like there's not that safety net there or like your life has to dramatically alter. But by looking ahead and saying, hey, I'm going to join the village so that I can age in place for as long as possible with a, a group of my peers and trusted friends, that's a beautiful and brilliant strategy to supporting that goal of staying at home. That may not be everybody's goal, right? If, if somebody wants to move in with their child or if they want to move to a warmer climate or if they have other goals, 
it's again that piece of it doesn't happen on accident and anything that you have a plan around and have done some time and some thinking and some reflection and research on goes better so i'm going to give you an example of again so if we think about for those of you who have bought property how many folks here have bought a house or a condo or made a big a big purchase I see a couple hands, even a car, like something you're going to invest your time and money in. Did you do some research? Did you check out different models? Did you look at different homes? Did you price check to be sure that you were getting the best value? Did you need to find the right realtor, the right dealership? When we think about most adult decisions that we make, there's a lot of time, intention, and research that goes behind that. But we don't give the same, we don't afford the same seriousness to aging. We just hope that people will be there for us or that it will work out. And, and then we tend to run into some specific challenges. So let's talk about what some of those challenges are. So Kathy, I believe that was you. You shared, you know, that there's examples of women who have cared for others and then the neighborhood changes or they're by themselves and they don't have the support they need. Are there, and that's a natural, that's a, a natural progression that many people experience, right? And, and oftentimes for people that have that long lifespan, you may, you may have lost sets of friends or sets of lovers, or you may have your children pass before you, which is something no one should have to bear, but we don't know what life is going to throw at us. So it's important to have that sense of, where am I going? What am I doing? And how am I going to build support? So one challenge is that isolation or that thing of that social system. What else are the other challenges that age can bring? And I know you all want me to tell you these. <laughs> Mary, I see you trying to talk. Do you mind unmuting? Myers. Sylvia, do you want to go first and then we'll hear from Mary? How, how about um, like the, the one thing I fear is I'm very active and what I fear is lack of mobility of being able to get around and do stuff and, you know, sort of not being able to do stuff for myself. That's really important for most people. And there's, I think in the last 20, 30 years, we have more data and more research that shows how important that being active is for our mental and physical health and wellness. And so there's always the personal things you can do, but sometimes those slide, right? So it's even helpful to build that into your wellness plan to say, hey, I need to go for a walk four days a week so that I'm moving my body and making sure that I'm mobile and less prone to falls and keeping my muscle mass up. I need to be sure I'm eating appropriately or check in with a nutritionist twice a year to be sure that I'm not deficient or that I'm, I'm giving my body the best chance to stay mobile. Um, those are great points, Sylvia. I think the physical mobility and the ability to be as independent as you are now is a major priority for many people as they age. Mary, how about you? Well, I was going to point to the difficulty in planning whether you move from your home into a, a care facility or retirement facility um, and how you decide whether you can make arrangements for yourself that way and have, I don't know, what sort of help that could be hired or you picture trying to move where one of your kids is but who isn't the, the type of person who you could move in with. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the choices aren't I find for, for us, the choices aren't great either, either way. Um, yeah. you know, remain where in the neighborhood, which is, would be great because there is a good facility here. Or you give all that up and all your old friends in your church and so on and go move near um, a daughter who would at least be willing to call the doctor for you or make sure your caregiver got there, even if they aren't the sort that could take you in. Those are really great points. 
And I think it again reiterates the need for prior planning because you have options, but if we don't, if we're not clear about those choices and let folks know what we want, then other people make those decisions, right? I'm working with a family right now. I'll give you two examples. One family I'm working with is the dad is in Florida and his son lives nearby, but his son and his other children are older themselves. They're in their seventies. And so they can't do the physical caregiving support that he would need. And this man is about, he's, he's coming to the end of his life. He's about to go on to hospice and all of that. But he didn't tell them what he wanted. So they're wrestling every day with, do we take it, keep him in the hospital? Do we take him to rehab? Do we try to care for him at home? What do we do? And this is a very independent, strong-minded man. He just <laughs> didn't look at, hey, I need to give my kids the tools to know what my decisions are. And... I'm working with a woman who's in California right now, same situation to what you're describing. She lives there. She loves California. It's way too expensive. She's living beyond her means. Her kid isn't out there. She's getting lonely, but she's not thrilled about the idea of moving to Chicago and moving in with him is even less thrilling. <laughs> so that won't work for their family. But we're having a series of conversations to really decide and define and balance out is being in California in the sunshine, but by yourself and paying twice as much for rent as you would pay here. Is that quality of life more than the quality of life you would have moving here? And I can show you the apartments, you know, that are available in your budget. You can be right on the lake. You can have a dog. You can achieve all these other goals that maybe she has. But you need time. We need time to understand and decide for ourselves and to also then take those steps. So, you know, Mary, to your point, you can say, okay, well, Montgomery Place is my plan. I'm going to move in there and they'll take care of me and I'm good. Or staying home is my plan. But with either one of those, there's still things to be figured out. What do you want your kids to be doing to help you? Is it in your budget? Is there any, any other planning that might need to happen? You know, Montgomery Place has that, um, I forget what they call the fund, but they have a fund to support people who do when they run out of money so that they don't have to kick people out if they can't afford to pay anymore. So that's, you know, that's a very reasonable place to, to consider moving to. But it's still also a personal decision. You know, are you somebody who wants to engage, is more social, wants to have that kind of um, communal setting, or would you much prefer to stay at home? So great points, and all those points deserve time and discussion. So that's really what care planning is. Let's think about that future, and let's figure out how to, how to make it bright <laughs> and in line with what you want. Okay, so I'm going to go get into, thank you, Mary, for sharing, thank you, Kathy, for sharing, and Sylvia for chiming in as well. I'm just a couple of these points that, in my experience, uh, whether it was providing direct care or managing a home care agency, I managed a caregiving agency for about 12 years before I started my company, there's a lot of challenges and we can't always know what challenges are coming our way, but we can plan for what is likely to happen. So some of them are up here, right? Some of the challenges may be chronic pain or injury. It may be memory loss or changes to cognition. It may be that the systems change, right? With the, you all I'm sure, have been through the experience of trying to wade through Medicare, supplemental plans, Advantage plans, what's, what's available. Even just navigating one system can be overwhelming. <clears throat> so it's important to recognize that that may be a challenge you run into, whether it's with paperwork or whether it's within a hospital system and you can't get a doctor to call you back or you don't fully understand a procedure, making sure that you have folks in your life that can advocate for you. Uh, sometimes people are over medicated or under medicated, and that can be a challenge. You know, when we have five or six specialists we go to, they are rarely talking to each other. So we 
that can be a challenge to stay on top of. Money is often a concern, and I'm going to get into that too in a minute. And then I think there's also identity challenges. And this is, you know, every company that does care planning and care management is different. They're all unique. For us, we focus on and come from a very inclusive place, and we center LGBTQ individuals, so lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender seniors, because we understand that aging can be difficult for most people, but if you're less likely to have kids, if you have experienced uh, oppression or harassment from your peers, then moving into senior housing might be a challenge. And whether we're talking about an identity such as being LGBTQ or whether we're talking about being a person of color and being concerned about how you'll be treated in senior care facilities, or if English isn't your first language, or if you have a religious belief other than Christian and that's important to you, there are unique challenges sometimes that come that are that are related to who we are and what's important to us to be thinking about as we're planning ahead. So you heard me mention finances earlier. Super passionate about this because aging is one of the most expensive investments that most of us are gonna make. So here's some numbers that I'm sure again, you probably are well aware of, but I'm gonna share them for anybody that might not be. So most Americans underestimate the cost of long-term care by about 50%. They don't have a clear idea of what these costs are. So if you do have kids, or if you have a power of attorney, now is probably the time to start educating them <laughs> about what senior care costs and about what caregivers cost, because you're taking these, these sessions, these classes, and you're educated about what this terrain looks like. Your kids and the people that care about you in your life may not even be looking this direction. And so they are, may not be aware that whatever you've saved, say that at some point you're in a position where it's time to go to have either round the clock care or be in a, in a long-term care facility. You can see this third bullet point, $92,000 a year is what a, a private room in a nursing home costs in Illinois. Hmm. So when we think about a number that large, and if I, on the caregiving side, for private caregivers in your home, it's also going to be around $100,000 a year if they are bonded, insured, and an employee. So, so these costs are significant. So it, it's important for us to plan for ourselves and also to articulate to our families, hey, here's the decisions I'm making. Here's what these costs are now. We cannot expect that there will be you know, whatever your financial situation is, your kids may have ideas that are incorrect. <laughs> and so it's really important to have some of these nuts and bolts conversations so they understand the costs and don't feel badly about spending your money or don't expect that they'll be able to do everything that, that you need because that's just not, it's not realistic for most people. Someone age 65 today has almost a 70% chance of needing some type of long-term care. So that's most of us. And women need care longer. So again, you can't, no one has a crystal ball. But if I, as a woman say, okay, I may have a longer lifespan. I need to figure out how my money's gonna work. I need to see where I can live that will be comfortable, where I'll have younger friends and people of different ages that can support me. I need to invest in intergenerational relationships. So something like the village is also really useful for that, to meet people who are in your, in your age bracket, but also younger and have time to build those meaningful connections together. So when should you call a care manager and what do they do? <laughs> so we'll get more into the weeds on this. These are some examples of when you might want to call a care manager. And I use care manager and patient advocate kind of interchangeably. Those are two areas of expertise that, are, that do essentially some of the same services. So anytime that you're approaching a life change, whether it's a medical procedure, there's been an accident or an injury, there's an unexpected diagnosis, 
for example, I can't tell you how many calls I've gotten about COVID. Somebody's coming out of the hospital and they had COVID and now they need to figure out caregivers and home health and equipment and all of that with these safety issues in place. I get calls from people who have an unexpected diagnosis around cancer or around other conditions that are changing the course of their lives and that they might need support around. If a loved one falls ill, right? So if you're caring for a, a spouse or a partner and something significant changes, that may be a time to call a care manager. And if you're becoming a caregiver or you, you um, need a caregiver, those are good times to make a call as well. Uh, for some of the things that we've talked about, if you wanna age at home, that's possible, but we should sit down and talk about what structures you're gonna need in place to do that well. Uh, and I, I really encourage you, if you are somebody that wants to age in community, have those conversations now and consistently and write it down. Because for many families, the idea of caring for someone at home feels overwhelming and they're not necessarily well equipped. So it takes time to make sure that they're on board with the idea and that your choice and your preference doesn't get taken away just because they don't know how to do it. Um, advanced directives, care managers can help connect you to financial planners and estate planners to make sure that your, that your finances and your legal projections are in place. And then also if you want to plan out end of life care, you know, we do a lot, we have a lot of conversations around hospice and palliative care and what comfort means versus uh, treating every condition through end of life. So it's, you know, if you have interest in this area, you should absolutely call a care manager just to discuss it and talk about your options. Most companies will talk to you for free to just have an initial conversation. But if you want to put a plan together, that's when you're, you're likely to be in the space of getting charged. What can care managers help with? We can help with wellness visits, with hiring and managing caregivers, finding senior apartments, uh, or senior housing, uh, making medical appointments, managing medical care and coordination, planning for current or future needs. And this one is so important, providing resources and tailored advice. I would imagine that you all probably like most people when you run into a problem or something that you want some support on, you probably ask your friends and you ask your networks and that can be helpful, but... <laughs> example with caregiving agencies there are uh, come back on screen for for dramatic effect there are 800 caregiving agencies in the state of illinois alone how do you know which ones are legitimate how do you know you're getting the right price how do you even know you have the right we have a process for how we hire caregivers through agencies you don't just call an agency and say hey who do you have we're going to introduce you to this family we contact the seven to 10 agencies we work with that we think would be the right fit for the family. We share enough information and say, we wanna interview that caregiver, whoever you've identified before we introduce you to the family so that we can take a lot of the, the pain and challenge out of what happens when you're hiring a caregiver, right? Your son or daughter, it might take them 10 to 15 hours to sort through the agencies and try to make the calls and understand the paperwork, we can do, get that done in about two hours. So some of it is, you know, do you have an expert or a guide? And so I, I think about care management in the same way that, like I wouldn't go into court and represent myself because <laughs> I'm not sure how that would turn out. <laughs> if I'm in new terrain and need resources or need a great provider, or I'm not sure who to trust, I want a guide. And that's what a care manager is. And most companies, it's not a, um, some companies have like packages, but most reputable care management companies understand that their services are not always necessary for you. So most companies will have consults as and when you need them and then provide support as and when you need. So for example, um, the woman I'm talking about that I just talked about from California, 
her son had called me a year and a half ago and we had a consultation and he called me back to say, Hey, I think my mom's ready to like talk with you and make some moves. Are you available for a consultation? Absolutely. Yes. Let's move at the speed that makes sense. So a good care manager should not be pushing you in any one direction. They should be providing you the context, sharing their professional networks and helping you approach aging and healthcare from an organized advocacy based place. Does that make sense? Mm. Has anybody on here used a manager before? No. Well, I'm so glad I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Mary, were you going to say something? I know I uh, know somebody, but I can't think who it was, so it's not, not a very good example. <laughs> trying to come <laughs> well, 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 actually, I, I do remember it was a friend, a friend who had terminal cancer, and she was alone. Um, so her um, health care power of attorney, who was a friend, but was officially her power of attorney, recommended that she, that she get a hold of care manager because she had th th these various options, care at home while she was dying or a nursing home or whether she should get, get a hospice right away or palliative care, that was a whole bunch of issues. So, so it was great having um, this care manager to kind of know how how each of those possibilities would play out mm -hmm. and what, what she needed. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great example. That's a perfect example of like let's play through the scenarios. As for myself, I've worked over a thousand individuals. So I've done this a thousand times. <laughs> so I can help you understand you know, what the pitfalls might be, what what is realistic, and how to have a great experience versus your kids or your loved ones who may be going through this the first time, learning all these systems when it's about you, the person they love the most. So it's like learning a new job without having training and without having somebody to mentor you <laughs> is how many of the, the children, adult children and folks that I work with feel. Dottie, do you mind chiming in here? Does your yes mean that you know a care manager? You've worked with a care manager before? Yeah, I, um, let me go back to see what my yes. Oh, I was responding to Michelle's earlier comment about uh, we were discussing physical activity, and Michelle <laughs> reminded us to participate in the village exercise classes. I see that. I see that. Well, I was hoping that yes was excitement for care management, but we'll take it for the exercise class. <laughs> the care management is very important, and it's, I've not used it. And um, I don't. I know people who I have friends who plan for long-term care, and um, but I think it's really important. And I think for particularly for single people to have a case manager, or um, in medical instances, is critical in navigating the medical system, the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. said, well said. And I'm sure that's that we could all share and compare some of the horror stories we've heard and lived through with regards to how your care can fall through the cracks when you're in a medical crisis, right? If you think about what's happening in a hospital setting, you have, you might run into three different people in the course of that day that are somehow related to your care, but nobody's really accountable for it. Right. And so you don't have that advocacy to ask questions to say, are the tests necessary? Is this the right course of action? Doctor, call me and explain to me what's happening to my loved one or to my client so that I can make sure that the decisions being made are ones that are in line with this person's wishes. Um, and so, you know, whether you have that advocacy in your network as a family member or a close friend, I think we all will have a better experience if we let folks in, right? So bring somebody with you to those doctor's appointments, go with your friends to their doctor's appointments, 
don't let anybody go through surgery and tell you it's not a big deal. <laughs> Surgical procedures, anything from a colonoscopy to, you know, a, a, a transplant, if it's happening in a medical setting, having an advocate there, whether they're, they're professional or personal, will improve the quality of your experience and the quality of your care. That's a great point, Patty. Thank you for sharing. I do have an example that I just thought of, and that was a, a couple that I know in the, um, the hus one husband um, developed cancer. The other husband, his husband ended up really becoming his case manager partially. But the, the keeping of the medical records, the medications, um, the insurance claims is, is a full-time job almost. It really is. It really is. And that's why, you know, that's why we do this work because there's not a roadmap for how to do it well. And you learn so much when you start to take on that role for somebody. So thank you. Thank you so much for sharing, Daddy. I'm going to share... So whether you are, because I'm, we're big believers that people are able to do a lot for themselves and that our job as care managers is to be alongside you in the journey, not up ahead a telling you what direction to go and not behind pushing you in any certain order, but to assess and support your needs for the years ahead. So here's areas that any care manager should be looking at to address. Uh, making sure that you're talking about housing. Again, we we center LGBTQ plus folks in our experience. So so many of our clients want to know: Has this place been trained? Do they have any gay or queer staff? Are they competent? You know, am I going to have a good experience there? For you, it might be that, or it might be other priorities. But really, being clear about what's housing going to look like. What are the legal needs and legal issues to address? What's the health terrain? Who are the providers? What are the medications? What are the needs? The financial side of things, what is, what is the finances that we have to work with? How are those expected or projected to, to be utilized in the years ahead? Uh, do we need to be planning for Medicaid or for public aid at some point? And care. So who's the support team? Who can advocate? who can provide caregiving support or maybe manage caregivers in the process. So these are some of the general areas to address. I also like to include things like spirituality and community and, you know, making sure that that social need is really fully addressed as well. If you're interested in starting care planning for yourself, because again, you know, I, I enjoy the work that we do and care managers are fantastic, but I know so many of you are very independent and capable people. So I wanted to give you a couple of tools. This AARP care guide is one of my hands down favorite DIY planning for care guides. Now this is the LGBT version. They have a prepare to care guide that is not LGBT focused and they have it available in Spanish as well. And if the village doesn't have this document, I would request it from ARP, Michelle. That might be a good thing to have on hand. You can see these contents here, how to start these conversations, how to make the plan, how to get your team together, how to find support, what care for yourself looks like, what are some of the resources available. And then these sample plans are really, really helpful. So what does a plan actually look like? I'm gonna scroll down to show you just kind of how organized this document is. I also know people that just do it themselves and kind of put together a plan in a Word document or on their own to be sure that their needs are addressed and met in the way they want. So you can see here, this is a checklist. What are your goals? What are your strengths? What are your needs gonna be? what's happening at home with finances. I'm not gonna go through all this because this is page 32 and it goes to, through page 48, but this is a comprehensive document that you can use to start care planning for yourself or for another person and keep things really, really organized. So I like that one a lot. And I'll forward this presentation so you all have access to these links. 
Um, the SAGE Create Your Care Plan, this is a document I co-authored with SAGE, which is Services and Advocacy for GLBT Elders. And this is specifically around care planning for medical procedures. Again, many people think, well, it's just, it's a routine surgery or it's not, no big deal. Anything that happens to our bodies, especially in older age, creates an opportunity for infection, for things to be introduced to the body, for weakening us in a way we didn't expect. So it is really important, whether your surgeon tells you it's routine, a routine treatment or a procedure, to put some kind of plan together. So this is just another kind of guide to how would I prepare for a short-term issue. So those are some, some care planning resources that I like. Um, every one of us should have our will, our power of attorney documents done. In Illinois, you can also do the POLST, the physician orders, um, the POLST form. You can do a DNR. There's many advanced directives that you can do. And I, I would guess you all have had some workshops on that. But these are the ones that, you know, if you do nothing else, please have these in place. Because the minute that you don't and need it, that's when choice is taken away. That's when either the court or your healthcare team will say, well, who's the next of kin? That's who has to make these decisions or who's the person who's most capable. So it's really, really important to make these decisions ahead of time. If you're coordinating care, I wanted to put a few different options in here for how to do that for yourself as well. Because again, with the village, you all are working collaboratively to support each other. So this is honestly my favorite tool, lots of helping hands. It's a way to create a, a community of support, plan for meals, visits, drop-ins um, easily and communicate easily about what's happening for your loved one. So that's some of the DIY. I am gonna share just a little bit about how to think about the values and the mission of a care management company. So again, every organization is different. Every care management company is different and has their own culture. Some people are solo practitioners. Some people have um, organizations where they have, have multiple staff. There's care management companies of all sizes. So it's important to understand how do you find the right fit? And for me as a, as a founder, it comes back to values. What are our values? What's important to our clients? And so these are just an example of two of our values. We have five, but I won't bore you with the rest of them. But our values are that clients are experts of their care and define their own success. So that our job is to be alongside them in their journey, not dictating to them what to do. We also recognize because we work with LGBTQ communities that we need to not just be um, serving LGBTQ folks, but creating more resources. So we need to be educating healthcare providers on these health disparities, on what happens for people who are HIV positive as they age, on the lived experiences of LGBTQ folks, so that senior organizations are more prepared to work with those communities. So I encourage you, if you're thinking about care management or working with a patient advocate, to start to think about what's important to you. How do you find, um, I'm gonna pull up one of the, the databases I like. Um, the Aging Life Care Association is a great place to start your search to find a care manager. Uh, but there's a couple of other associations as well. There's a case management association, there's a patient advocacy association. So I'll include those in the slides as well. So you have access to those. But important and what it oftentimes comes down to is does this person get you? Do they hear you? And will they be there for you for the long term? So I'd always recommend working with an organization, if you can, that has more than one practitioner, because what happens if that person gets sick or if they have a family emergency, you want to have some backup and a system in place to help make sure that your care doesn't drop. Um, also make sure that it's in your price range. I'll talk pricing because I'm sure that'll be a question, uh, but care management companies I've seen kind of runs the gamut. 
oftentimes with a solo practitioner, they may charge a little less because they have less overhead. So I've seen solo practitioners as low as $100 an hour, but now the rates are, are much higher for care management in general from a reputable organization. So typically for care management, you're gonna be paying anywhere from 150 an hour, 175 an hour, up over $200 an hour. The ones that are a little higher, in my experience, tend to be kind of only nurses, like that's their model as a nursing medical model. And so they're really great for those complex cases or if things are happening and and you're not you need a, a a medical advocate that can explain to you your choices and really talk to the doctors in a different way. So that's kind of the range. I know it's a wide range. For us, our rates are 175 an hour, and we slide down to free for families that need it. So my background's in social work. Um, and so it was important to me to have kind of a business social services hybrid. So we work with anybody and don't let, don't let finances be an issue. That's not the case for most care management companies. So it's a question to ask. And you can, you know, if you want to, you can always try to negotiate if, you know, if they'll work with you around price. It's not covered by in insurance, typically. We have been covered by long-term care insurance periodically, but it depends on the plan. So if that's something that you're not sure about, I would definitely get a copy of your policy and just review it to see if care coordination or care management is covered, because it might be. And of course, if you have questions, you can always reach out to me. I'm gonna um, just see if there's any immediate questions right now, and then I'll share my contact info again. Have I brought us to tears? Are we still here? Um, could you could you state again the the several places that give you an overview of the care agencies? I'm not sure. Um, I, I've got as many words as aging, and it doesn't <laughs> tell us much. The, uh, the organizations where you can find a care manager? Yes, yes. Okay, yes. I'll put that in the chat. Um, I'll put the Aging Life Care Association is who I met, that's who were, were our professional association. And then I'll try to pull up those other websites so you have them. Oh, and they're in the presentation. Okay. So Michelle, are you able to send this presentation around or Ina Grace, can is somebody from the village send that around? Yes, I'll I send the recording and I can include link. If you email me some links, I'd be happy to include those as well. Perfect, we'll do that, we'll do that. So you'll have this in your email. Okay. Other questions? Um, it occurs to me how, how accessible or available is one of these, do these agencies or people tend to be if you have a total medical crisis and, you know, in one day the person's coming out of the hospital and you have no way to, or has had an accident or anyway, is there not quite emergency, but is there rapid Yes. Can there be rapid response? There should be. There absolutely should be. Um, the way that I think about this is always from a prevention lens, right? So if I'm in a hospital, I don't want the first time I'm talking to an advocate to be from that hospital bed because I'm stressed, I'm in pain, I'm, you know, in an anxious place because I'm making decisions. So I would do, recommend doing this research ahead of time and meet with a couple of companies, have a few conversations see and ask your questions about, listen, if I go to the hospital in the middle of the night, will somebody meet me or will they call the doctor and will you be available? So every agency is different. And that's why, again, there's kind of a balance. I recommend working with an agency that has more than one practitioner. So you have that backup. But I find that when agencies are too large, then sometimes you lose that personal touch and that flexibility. So 
it's up to you what you want, but you know, Hyde Park is a community and operates as a community. <laughs> and so I think where a place where you can have that personal touch and personal connection is probably really important. Any other questions folks have? I'll share my contact info. You can reach out if you like. And to me, I'm, I've been a huge fan of Ike Village. As I said earlier, Susan, it's great to see you again. I appreciate all the work that you all do. Um, and please don't be a stranger. Reach out if you have, if you need resources or just want to connect. Jacqueline? Yes. Can you, oh, great. I did have a question. This is Liz. Um, here for myself and also for uh, a close relative. So we're both um, uh, listening in. She couldn't be here today, though. I'm wondering um, two things. If your advocacy includes support around just the everyday tasks and chores of life, if you feel that you're being, um, uh, oh, I don't know what the word is, you know, uh, not looked down upon or marginalized or cheated, but, you know, not treated mm -hmm. fairly. There it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. In terms of simple things like car repair or home repair or dealing with businesses, you know, mm -hmm. outside of the medical uh, realm, is, is that part of what's, um, is, is that a challenge that you help people through? Certainly. Absolutely. Yes. So, for again, as I said, every agency is different. So I can't speak for all agencies, but for us, we provide as much or as little support as people want. So, and it's very holistic. Mm -hmm. So if you're struggling with, you know, getting your oil changed or getting some car repairs done and you need a reputable place, we'll absolutely work to find you a reputable place and even go with you if you need. But, you know, I'm, as a social worker, I try to be really careful about people's finances and support. So if I had a client like that, I would probably say, maybe we need to get a personal assistant in place that's going to be about $30 an hour versus our $175 an hour rate appointments. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a, a different rate, but like we try to think strategically long term about what is it you need? Because we can do that. But if there's a series of things like maybe getting a, a highly qualified caregiver or companion or a personal assistant might make more sense. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, that does. That sounds like a good solution. And the second quick question, you emphasize that your agents, you and your agency center LGBTQ uh, members of the community. Do you serve other members outside of that group, people of yes. color, for example? Absolutely, absolutely. And that's actually one of the things I'm most proud of because there's not, in senior services, I find that there's a whole lot of folks that feel overlooked and invisible, either because they're, they're not diverse in who's coming through the door or in their marketing or in who works there. And so we're one of the only care management companies that also really focuses on the South Side um, and is Black owned. So that's we work at a lot of different intersections um, and and I think it's a strength because if you're doing it right for people that have been traumatized or hurt within healthcare settings then you're doing it right for everybody. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Jacqueline, Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Jacqueline and I, what we first met four years ago, was it? Yep. <laughs> When Jacqueline organized a really great conference uh, down on Seventy Third Street, I think, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and again, it was it was a very helpful and very inclusive group that um, disseminated a lot of very good information. I thank you for this. This is, I think, very helpful. Thank you, and we loved having you. I, I'm not joking. I'm a huge fan of the Village because I think they do such a wonderful job of connecting people to resources and to each other. And so, yeah, I was just a big fan of it. I was like, can you come talk <laughs> and let folks know the village exists? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I felt badly that I didn't have time really to follow up with all the connections that you provided at that session. It was, it was very helpful. <laughs> well, thank you. And thanks for being here, Susan. Okay, um, uh, Michelle or 
Uh, Ina Grace, anything you all want to say in closing or should we let folks get on with the rest of their afternoon? Yeah, um, I'll share the recording soon and with some links from Jacqueline and I'll put your contact in there as well. Jacqueline. Okay. So um, if any questions come up. Okay, uh, sounds good. Barbara, I, did you know anything? I, I'm, I just want to say that I'm really glad to know about you. This is probably exactly the kind of people that I need to help me with a few things. Um, some sort of minor, some major. Uh, I've done a lot, but I, I need to do more and I need to go back to what I've done and look at it. So I didn't know there were organizations like this that could give such a wide range of assistance. Yeah, well, thank you so much. And thanks for having me. And just consider me a resource. You know, I'm, I'm very close to Hyde Park. I live in Washington Park. So right. a big fan and friend. So if you need anything, just reach out. Thank yeah, you. I have a Thank question you. that I... Um, well, this is Ellie. Ellie had a question. Uh, I was wondering, you know, um, for someone like me who doesn't need any help now, but I don't have any relatives in the Chicago area, uh, if I did advanced planning, should I be thinking of all the possible levels of care that I might need or, or just simply get acquainted with you and let you know about my situation and then uh, wait till I need care to think about uh, what, what I should do? I honestly, so I'm 37 and I think about this all the time and have these conversations all the time with my friends and loved ones, just because I don't want there to be any confusion at a decision point as to what I would want them to do. Because that's a really heavy weight that people carry. And no matter if you have the conversation one time to say, no, it's really okay. I, you know, I like, I think I'd like living in senior housing. It's totally fine with me to move into a senior setting. Like your family might need to hear that or your power of attorney might need to hear that a few times. If you're somebody that doesn't have kids, it might take time to identify who that power of attorney is. Or that's another service that companies like mine can provide is to be your power of attorney if there's nobody else who can do it. So I would say start today. I, I say plan early, plan often. So whatever's on your mind, start to think about and have these conversations, whether it's with somebody like me or with somebody else who's in the same situation, like you all as the, the village could even have a care planning workshop. And that's something I'd be happy to offer if that would be of use, but to have a workshop about like, okay, let's look at this. Let's look at housing and my goals for care and my finances and who's gonna do this, that or the other so that you can actually start to put some of that together. So yeah, don't delay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. I hope you have a beautiful afternoon and enjoy this cold but bright day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Jacqueline. We appreciate your presentation.